The Holy Spirit is the key to everything in the Christian life. He is the one who gives us assurance that we truly belong to the Lord. Now, how can you know for certain that God the Father is God your Father? I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve, inviting you to open your Bible to Romans chapter eight as we continue our study of this great chapter in a message titled, When God Becomes Father. If you have your Bible, please turn to Romans chapter 8. We started a series just a couple of weeks ago entitled More Than Conquerors from Romans 8, 37. And today I want to talk to you about this subject, when God becomes your father. Fanny Crosby is a well-known name to people in church. She was famous for all the hymn writing that she did. She wrote over 8,000 hymns and gospel songs. She's been called the queen of gospel song writers. Fanny Crosby was blinded when she was six weeks old because a doctor's remedy for swelling in her eyes caused uh, that her eyes to be burned out, her irises to be burned out. It It couldn't be remedied, and so she was blind. And she had such a great attitude toward that. I was watching a a video clip this morning about Fanny Crosby, and she said, you know, I don't know whatever happened to that doctor. He's probably dead by the time she was doing this testimony. And she said, but I would love to get to see him, to meet him, and to thank him for what he did because she says, God has used this for such good in my life. She had the wonderful poem, Oh, What a Happy Soul, Am I, although I cannot see, I am resolved that in this world contented I shall be. How many blessings I enjoy that other people don't, who weep and sigh because I'm blind. I cannot, nor I won't. And God used her in such great ways. Well, one of her most famous hymns, we just sang a piece of it just a minute ago, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. She had blessed assurance. Do you have blessed assurance? Is that your song that Jesus Christ is your Savior. You know, it's one thing to be able to say God is Father, but it's quite another thing to be able to say God is my Father. He is my Savior. The Lord is my Savior, my Lord, my King, my Redeemer. It is personal. And when we talk about becoming a child of God, lots of people have a wrong understanding of that. They believe that everyone is a child of God. That's not true. Everyone is a creation of God. God is creator of all things. Nothing came into being that the Lord didn't create. But the Bible makes it clear when we're born into this world, Ephesians chapter 2, and you were dead in your trans, uh, trespasses and sins in which we formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And among them, we all too formerly walked and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Separated from God, not a child of God, a child of wrath. Jesus said to the Jews as he was arguing with them in John chapter 8, the religious leaders, he said, you are of your father, the devil. They're not children of God. They were children of the devil. And everyone is born into this world a child of wrath, a child of the devil. You have to be born again in order to be a child of God. And that happens 
in a moment in time. See, becoming a Christian is a lot like getting married. There has to come a point in time where you say, I do. I do to the Lord, where you receive him by grace through faith. Well, Paul wrote Romans 8, the Mount Everest of chapters in the New Testament, and the emphasis of Romans 8 is on the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit does and what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ as evidenced by his Holy Spirit. See, Jesus said to the disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the helper won't come. And the helper, who is he? He's just like me. He's another just like me. And he's going to come and he's going to be with you, just like I'm with you, but even better, because he'll be in you, in you. And he was speaking of the Holy Spirit of God. And so the Holy Spirit is the key to everything in the Christian life. And he gives us blessed assurance that we belong to the Lord Jesus. Now, maybe you're here and you have a hope so, maybe so, guess so salvation. What is that? Well, you, somebody asks you, hey, do you know for certain if you were to die, you'd go to heaven? I hope so. Well, maybe so, guess so, I think so. Yeah, but do you have a no-so salvation? I was in a laundromat when I was in college one time, and I was talking to this guy, Bart, and I was talking to him about the Lord. I said, Bart, do you know for certain if you were to die tonight that you'd go to heaven? And he said, no, I don't, and you don't either. No one can know that. That's not something you can know until you die and you find out. I said, well, this is what the Bible says, 1 John chapter 1 verses 12 and 13. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know, K-N-O-W, know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know it. As you're sitting there today, God wants you to know that you are His. And if you're not His, God wants you to know that you're not so that you can receive Christ and become His wonderful child. Well, Romans chapter 8, as Fanny Crosby wrote her hymn, Blessed Assurance, no doubt she had Romans 8, 14 through 17 in her mind. Let's hear what the Lord has to say in the, that passage. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba. Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. Question, how can you know if God the Father is God your Father? If God the Father... Is God your father if he is really your father and you're really his child? Well, there are three blessed assurances in the passage that we just read. Blessed assurance number one, a true child of God has the internal witness of the Spirit. The internal witness of the Spirit. Look at verse 16 again. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, the Spirit himself. Now, Romans 8, emphasis, heavy, heavy emphasis on the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is referred to 27 times in the book of Romans, 17 of the 27 in chapter 8. And the Holy Spirit is the, uh, the most unknown for many Christians of the Trinity, you know, we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, uh, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And we know about God the Father. Most people know about God the Father, and we know about God the Son, but God the Spirit, uh, that's kind of mysterious to us. We really don't know. And there are a lot of things that get attributed to the Holy Spirit of God, the third person in the Trinity, God the Son, that make him seem weird. I mean, you go to churches and they'll talk about, well, the, you know, the Spirit is, is coming upon us in such a great way. And what does that mean? 
Well, to them, that means that you see people running around the church. Well, why are you running around the church? Because of the Holy Spirit. See people rolling around on the ground. Why, why are you doing that? Oh, the Holy Spirit. See people laughing uncontrollably. Why are you doing that? Oh, the Holy Spirit. See people shaking and convulsing. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in Scripture do you ever see that happening uh, when Jesus would meet with the crowds. They didn't do that. Who is the Holy Spirit? He's another just like Jesus. So he's going to conduct his ministry in the same way Jesus conducted his ministry. And if you want to get technical, how did Jesus conduct his ministry? In the power of the Holy Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need to understand how the Holy Spirit works. Now, I love this. You may have heard this said. When it comes to salvation, God the Father thought it. He came up with the plan of salvation. God the Son bought it when he died on the cross and rose again from the, de the dead. And God the Holy Spirit wrought it. He's the one who works it out. Jesus ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit came 10 days later on the day of Pentecost, and he convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He came to live inside the hearts of believers, and he's the one that enables us to live the Christian life. He brought the uh, justification where the Lord wraps his gavel, says, uh, not guilty. Just as if you've never sinned, you're justified uh, before God. He brings about sanctification. He works in us so that we can become more and more like Christ. And one day, he's going to bring about glorification where we say goodbye to this body of sin. We get a brand new body from the Lord, a body that is not uh, tainted anymore by sin. It's all the work of the Holy Spirit. So a true child of God has the internal witness of the Spirit. Now, you mark it down, the telltale mark of a believer is the indwelling spirit. See, what makes the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? You say, well, a Christian goes to church. Yeah, lots of non-Christians go to church. Somebody as well said, in the average Baptist church, roughly half the crowd has never been born again. Half. That's a lot. And so, you say, well, a Christian goes to church. Well, non-Christians go to church, too. And Sundays, churches are filled all over the, the nation, all over the world with people who don't really know the Lord. You say, well, a Christian does good works. Yeah, non-Christians do good works too. They, they give money and they go and help out here and serve in the soup kitchens and, and help clean up yards and what have you. The disaster relief, they do that. You say, well, a, a Christian's been baptized. Yeah, a lot of non-Christians have been baptized too. We call them wet sinners. Uh, they... they <laughs> They've never been born again, but they've gotten baptized. You know, you want an example of that? Uh, Acts chapter 8, Simon the magician. He supposedly believed and was baptized, but obviously he wasn't a true believer, and the Scripture bears that out. What makes the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian? The presence of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what makes the difference. So, Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says this, talks about uh, being according to the flesh versus according to the Spirit. We talked about that last time. And the Scripture makes it clear. You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. He is none of his. That's what makes the difference, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, you need to see the flesh and the spirit uh, in terms of w where everyone is, because everyone in the world is in two camps. You're either in the flesh or you are in Christ. In the flesh or in Christ. Now, in the flesh, the Bible makes it clear, those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the spirit, the same things of the spirit. The mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. For the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject, subject itself to the law of God. It is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Where do you start out in life? You start out in the flesh. You start out in Adam. You're born in Adam. And you receive from your great, 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 great grandfather, Adam, a dead spirit. Dead toward God. You're dead toward God. And in Adam all die. 1 Corinthians 15. You have to be born again so that you can be in Christ. And in Christ, all are made alive. 
And the leader of team in Christ is the Holy Spirit. And the leader of team in Adam is the flesh. And so get that right, because everyone in this room, everyone in the sound of my, under the sound of my voice, you're either in, in Adam and you're on the highway to hell, or you're in Christ and you're on the highway to heaven. And what makes the difference? You receive Christ as Savior and Lord, and he transfers you, delivers you from the domain of darkness and transfers you into the kingdom of his beloved son. He gives you his Holy Spirit. Boom, the light comes on. The Spirit makes you alive inside. And when the Lord comes in, the light comes in. When the light comes in, the life comes in. And all of a sudden, things have changed. You're a new creation in Christ. So the telltale mark of a believer is the indwelling Spirit. And the indwelling Holy Spirit testifies with evidence that we are in Christ. The Spirit, verse 16, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. He testifies, that's what that bears witness means, testifies, testifies jointly with us that we belong to Christ. That word also means to corroborate by evidence that we belong to Jesus Christ. You say, well, what's the evidence? How does he corroborate with evidence? What is the testimony that the Spirit gives us that we belong to Christ? Well, here's how this works. The moment that you receive Christ, you go from, I was in Adam, now I'm in Christ. I was uh, delivered from the domain of darkness, delivered into the kingdom of his beloved son. Go from darkness to light, from death to life. All those are uh, phrases that are used in the New Testament. And so I am in life now in the Lord. Dead man brought to life. I, I, First, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And when the Lord comes in by his spirit, things change. And here's the biggest witness that you and I receive as Christians. All of a sudden, our attitude towards sin, totally different. Totally different. You see sin differently once you become a child of God. So I became a Christian when I was... 17 years old, uh, senior in high school, January 1980, prayed to receive Christ. I went from being in Adam to being in Jesus. I didn't understand all of what that meant. All I knew is that I needed Jesus. I, I knew that I was convicted about my sin because the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, and I saw that I was a sinner. He convicts of righteousness, that Jesus is righteous, and he convicts of judgment, that sinners who stand before a righteous Lord are going to be condemned. There is judgment. And so I saw all that, and I responded to Jesus. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Save me. And he did. So here I am. I'm a brand new believer. I've only been a Christian for a few weeks. And I have an opportunity to participate in my favorite sin. And so I'm thinking, this is awesome. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, there is conviction from the Holy Spirit. Don't do that. What? What do you mean, don't do that? This is what I live for. This is what I do. Don't do that. You can't do that anymore. You are mine, and you are not allowed to do that anymore. There was conviction. I, I said to myself, whoa, something has changed inside of me. This is not like going to church this is a transformation that has taken place in my heart. And I was getting the conviction of the Holy Spirit that I had never experienced before. And the Holy Spirit was bearing witness that, Jeff, you're now a child of God, and you have been bought with a price. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple, literally the holy of holies, of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Hey, do you have the witness of the Spirit that tells you you belong to Him, that tells you that you are His, that you belong to God, that you're a child of God? You know, if you can sin and it doesn't bother you to sin, that's a huge indicator that you've never been saved. 
You know, when the Lord saves you, he doesn't fix it so you can't sin anymore. He fixes it so you can't sin and enjoy it anymore. And if you are living a life of sin and all of a sudden uh, you say, man, uh, this is so wonderful and there's no conviction from the Holy Spirit, it's just proof positive that you've never been saved. There's no witness inside your heart that you belong to him. But if as a Christian, you say, I've given my heart and life to Christ, but I'm struggling with sin, I'm stumbling, I'm failing, I'm falling, and there's conviction from the Lord that what you're doing is wrong, that's a good sign. You see, a pig never feels dirty, right? If you could talk to a pig, he's rolling around there in the mud, and you say, hey, pig, you, what do you think about the mud? You feeling dirty? He said, feeling dirty? What are you talking about? Man, this is my nature. I love to roll around in the mud. Christian has a new nature. He ha he's become a partaker of the divine nature. And if he falls in the mud, she falls in the mud, you feel the dirt. That is the witness of the Holy Spirit. So that's the first blessed assurance. A true child of God has the internal witness of the Spirit. Secondly, a true child of God has the ongoing leadership of the Spirit. Verse 14, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Now, some people read that and they say, hmm, well, I, don't, I don't know because I don't know if... I don't know if I'm really being led by the Spirit of God. I mean, there's a lot of inconsistencies in my life, and I, I want to be led by the Spirit, but, but a lot of times I take my own way, and I go my, I do what I want to do, and I, I put self on the throne, and I say no to, to God's way for my life. And so maybe, maybe I'm not a son of God because maybe I, I don't, I'm not led by the Spirit. Well, remember this. Two teams. Two teams. The in-Adam teams led by the flesh. And, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That, that the flesh is the broad road that leads to destruction. The, if you're in the flesh, you're in Adam. In Adam all die, you're on the highway to hell. And that's where everyone starts. But you receive Christ. You understand that Jesus died for you. You receive Christ. And now you are placed in Christ. And the leader of the in Christ team is the Holy Spirit. He's your leader. All who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So are you on the team? Because the team leader is the Holy Spirit. That does not mean that you do everything the Holy Spirit wants you to do, otherwise you're, you're off the team. He doesn't kick you off the team. He is leading the team. And so we have that uh, that assurance that, wait a minute, I'm on, I'm on the team, and the Lord is the leader. The Lord's Spirit is the leader. Now, the Lord, you mark it down, He is faithful to lead us, faithful to lead His children. Sometimes we get the idea that, you know, when it comes to the leadership of the Lord, He's playing the shell game with us. Have you ever seen magicians play the shell game? They have three walnut shells, and they'll have some little spongy ball or a, or a hardened little pea, and they put it under, and they say, okay, now try and guess where the pea is. And they do it all, you know, move it all around, and then you try, and well, it's in the middle one. Nope, you got it wrong. It's in this other one. Sometimes people have the idea that's what God's doing with his will. You know, I, I, God, I want to know where you want me to go. Where he leads me, I will follow, but he's not really showing me, and so I don't know what to do, and God's playing the shell game with me. God doesn't play the shell game. The Lord wants you to do His will. He's not trying to hide His will from you. He's not trying to trick you or, or uh, trap you and trip you up. He, he wants you to know it. And so those who are sons of God, they will be led by the Spirit, and the Lord will be faithful to do that. You think about it in the Old Testament. How did the Lord do it in the Old Testament? He was leading His people in the Old Testament when he, they came out of Egypt going into the Promised Land, and it was very, very clear that God was leading them. You know, Moses was the human instrument that the Lord used to lead them, but how did Moses figure out where we're supposed to go? He was following the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. The Scripture says this in Exodus chapter 13, and the Lord was going before them in a, in a pillar of cloud by day 
to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. They could easily see, hey, we're supposed to move out because the Lord is on the move, and he was leading his people. Isaiah 40, verse 11 says, He shall lead his flock, or feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those who are with young. The Lord is our shepherd, and he leads us to green pastures, and he will be faithful to lead because he's the leader of Team in Christ. Are you on that team? Now, the Lord is faithful to lead us, but a Christian is to be faithful to listen and obey. A Christian is to be faithful to say, yes, Lord, and to follow. Where he leads me, I will follow, as the song says. On the radio this past week, Real Truth for Today, there was a lady that called in, and uh, she was 90 years old. She was just so vibrant, so strong. And, and I talked to her, and I said, I said, how old are you? And she said, 90. You're not supposed to ask a woman how old she is. So I said, how much do you weigh? No, I didn't, I didn't do that. But she didn't, she didn't mind. And so she said, I'm 90 years old. I said, you, your voice sounds like you're 50. And she said this. She said, every morning I have a quiet time with the Lord, and I pray every morning until I touch the throne of God. She spent time with the Lord. Hey, he's faithful to lead. We have to be faithful to listen and obey and follow. We have to be faithful to say with Jesus, not my will, but yours be done. And I, I want to follow you. Uh, here, here's where the flesh wants to go. But I say no to the flesh. I say yes to the Spirit. And I'm going to follow you. You know, we all have trouble with electronics. Almost everybody has a cell phone or an iPad or a computer. And those things can be great, but they can be very distracting. Do you notice how uh, your phone will tell you how much screen time you've had this week? Man, that's like a message from the Lord saying, get off your phone. You've been on there. Look how much screen time you've had. And, and listen, I'm not unlike you. I, I struggle with that too. And when it comes to spending time with God, that can really crowd out our quiet time. Because we need to put all that stuff away, and we need to seek the Lord, and we need to hear his voice. God speaks to us through his word. We speak to God through prayer, and we need to have that time with the Lord. Are you having that time with the Lord? What I found is when people start to really struggle with wondering, am I really a Christian? It's typically because there's sin in their lives. And they start to say, well, I'm, if I'm on team in Christ and the Holy Spirit is my leader, I'm not following very well. So I guess the Lord is, is done with me. I guess maybe I'm not a Christian because I'm not following very well. Well, the, the leader of team in Christ is the Holy Spirit, whether you follow well or not. The question is, have you put your faith and trust in Christ? Because if you put your faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation, you're on the team. And then the goal of the team is for you to listen and obey, to do what he said. You may remember in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah, who just won a great victory on Mount Carmel in chapter 18, now he's running for his life because he heard that Queen Jezebel was going to kill him. And uh, he is so discouraged and so depressed. He comes off the mountaintop experience on Mount Carmel, chapter 18, to the, just down in the dumps, and it happened just like that. And he says, it is, it is enough, O Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my father's. He prayed for God to kill him. And God wasn't going to kill him. God was going to give him an experience with him. And so the Lord uh, brought him up to a mountain. And the Lord was going to reveal himself to Elijah. And if you remember, the Lord uh, had him stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by. And Elijah 
heard and saw the strong wind that was breaking the rocks, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And then there came an earthquake that shook the mountains, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And then came a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And then there came a still, small voice, the sound of a gentle blowing, God's whisper. This is the way. Walk in it. And that's where the Lord was in the still small voice, in the gentle blowing, in the gentle whisper. How are you and I going to hear from God? We have to get everything out, and we have to focus in on him. The Lord says, and you'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. He will be faithful to lead. We need to be faithful to listen and obey. And then assurance number three. Not only the internal witness of the Spirit, not only the ongoing leadership of the Spirit, because it says in verse 14, are being led, it's ongoing, it's not past tense, it's present tense. And then thirdly, a true child of God has the loving adoption of the Spirit. So the, the Spirit leads us, the Spirit gives us a witness, you belong to Christ, and the Spirit adopts us into the family. Verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Adoption as sons, what the Holy Spirit does. Now, it says that we haven't received a spirit of slavery that leads to fear again. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the Christian is no longer a fearing slave of sin. You don't have to fear. You're, you're not under law. You're under grace. So, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and of death. You haven't received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Oh, no, I'm under the law again, and I'm failing, and the law condemns me. He, he says, you, you don't have that anymore. You've received a spirit of adoption. You've been adopted into God's family. And you are now a beloved child of God. We don't have to be living under the fear of being separated from God. As Rochelle read from Romans 8, 31 through 39, when we started off the, this, the uh, service today, what shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or peril or famine or sword? No, nothing. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from that. And so a Christian, once you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are a beloved child of God. I was listening to a, a message by John Lennox, Dr. John Lennox, mathematics professor at Oxford. He's retired now, Professor Emeritus. He has debated Christopher Hitchens and uh, Richard Dawkins, two very well-known atheists. I got to talk to John Lennox on Friday and do an interview. We're going to play it for this Friday. And uh, from, from England, I was able to interview him. I was a little nervous because, uh, I mean, John Lennox is a really smart guy, and Pastor Jeff is not. Uh, I'm not the village idiot, but, but uh, talking to this guy, you know, it's like a five-talent guy and a one-talent guy, and so I felt a little out of uh, place there. But I was listening to something that he had done. He was talking about his wife, and he was talking about salvation, and it, salvation is not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast. And he said this. He said, he said, you know, I've been married for 40 years to my wife, Sally, he said, well, what would it have been like if I had gone to her and said, well, Sally, I have a little gift for her, for you, and she opened it up, and it was a cookbook. And he said to her, now listen, it says on page 147 how to make apple cake. 
And if you make apple cake just the way I want you to make it, along with all these other recipes in this cookbook, maybe after 40 years of marriage, I'll accept you as my wife. He said, it doesn't work like that, does it? He said, no, it doesn't work like that at all. He said, but that's the way we have it with God. We think, well, I have to do all these things, and if I do all those things, then God will accept me. Listen, the moment you receive Christ, Ephesians 1, 6, you are accepted in the beloved. I accept Christ. He accepts me. Yeah. It has nothing to do with me, how good a guy I am, how, how circumspectly I walk. It has to do with Jesus. Remember when David wanted to show kindness to Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth? And Mephibosheth was hiding out thinking David, uh, the new king, was going to kill all the, the line from the old kingdom from the house of Saul. And so they go get Mephibosheth. He's living in Lodabar, which means place of no pasture. And they get him. He's crippled in his legs. They get him. They bring him before the king. He thinks for sure David's going to kill him. And David says, I want to bring you to my house. I want you to eat at my table. I want you to have all the, the blessings of my kingdom. And Mephibosheth says, why would you do that for a dead dog like me? And he said, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for your dad, Jonathan, for Jonathan's sake. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God for Christ's sake also has forgiven you. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Jesus. And we're accepted in the blood the moment that we accept Christ as Savior and Lord. That is good news. So the Christian is a beloved child of God. We're able to cry out, Abba, Father. Now, we're adopted into the family. Here's something you need to remember. The Bible will use different kinds of analogies. So, the Bible talks about being a slave of Christ, a doulos of Christ, and we are. The Bible talks about being uh, born again and being a son of God. We are. We're, we're the born ones of God. And then the Bible talks about being adopted into God's family. You say, well, I don't get this. I mean, if I'm, if I'm born into God's family, why do I need to be adopted into his family? Well, the, the analogy of being born into God's family as Jesus told Nicodemus in John 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He can't even see the kingdom of God. You must be born again, Nicodemus. Well, to be born again, that means you take the divine nature of God. We are partakers, 2 Peter 1, 4. We're partakers of the divine nature. But adoption into the family means you have standing before God, legal standing before God, to be an inheritor of all that God has for us. And then the Bible also says we're the bride of Christ. So all those images are put together so that we would fully understand what we have in Jesus. Now you think of the Abba Father. You know, that's only used three times in Scripture, that word Abba. That's an Aramaic word. It means Papa. It means Daddy. It's what a little child cries out when, when the little child is relating to Dad special name. Only children call the father Abba, and it's, an, it's intimacy. A slave never would call his master Abba because you didn't do that. You know, I have three girls. Those three girls call me dad, daddy, Dodie. Sometimes they have different names for me. Uh, but, but they're able to do that. Nobody else can do that. You, you start calling me daddy, I'm thinking, what's up with you? I mean, that, you know? But my girls can do that because they have that relationship with me. You have the relationship with God. Can you say, Abba, Father, is he your daddy? You know, Jesus was the first one to say that when he's in the garden of Gethsemane. And he said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here with me. Watch and pray. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went a stone's throw from Peter, James, and John, and he fell down on his face. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Let this cup pass from me. When he was in the, the very uh, 
toughest time in his ministry when he was facing the sin of the whole world crashing in upon him, so much so that he began to sweat drops of blood. What does he do? He cries out and he says, Abba, Daddy, Father, save me from this hour. We're able to do that as children of God. We can cry out to the Lord and we can say with confidence, you're my Abba. You know, the, the Spirit doesn't have us say, I am a child of God. He has us just cry out, Daddy, Father, you're my Father, you're my God. And not only is the Christian a beloved child of God, but the Christian is a joint heir with Jesus Christ. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, or a better translation, since children, He's not saying... Uh, maybe or maybe not. He's saying, if we're children, since we're children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So here is the progression. We were in Adam, slaves to sin, to sin and death, under the condemnation of death. But then we receive Christ. We become a child of God. We're adopted into the family. We're given sonship. We're given standing. And we're made to be heirs of the kingdom of God. We receive everything as a son would receive of the kingdom of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. It says in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the sheep and goats judgment, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's true for every Christian. We'll get to inherit the kingdom. The thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, we'll get to be, we'll participate in that. And since it's this side, and for those of us who has given their hearts and lives to Christ, we're going to be raptured. We're going to be glorified. When we come back with Jesus at the battle of Armageddon, we're going to rule and reign with him in glorified bodies. Those that meet the Lord who put their faith and trust in him during the seven-year tribulation period, they're going to get to come into the kingdom, but they don't come in with glorified bodies. They're still human beings. They haven't yet been glorified. But we're going to be glorified with him for a thousand years. And then at the end of the thousand years, where the Lord deals with Satan forever and he deals with sinners forever at the great white throne judgment, then you have Revelation 21 and Revelation chapter 22. That's the eternal state. And that's when things are beautiful. There is no more sin ever, ever, ever. And we receive the inheritance. And what is the ultimate inheritance for a Christian? It is God Himself. Revelation 22, and there shall no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His bondservants, the doulos, that's another uh, reference to us, shall serve Him, and they shall see His face and his name shall be on their foreheads, and there shall no longer be any night, and there shall, they shall not have need of the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, because the Lord God shall illumine them, and they shall reign forever and ever. We get to see his face. God will dwell among us. And I don't care what other thing there could be, there's nothing that can compare with living with God for all eternity. And we see his face. That's what's in store for every Christian. If we suffer with him, and he's speaking of the Christian life, discipleship, we suffer with Christ. Why? Because Jesus said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Paul said to Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Yea, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified with him. And that is coming in the future. Hey, we have so much in Jesus. Blessed assurance... Jesus is mine. Let me close out with this story. John Wesley, the father of the Methodist church, he was a, an Anglican uh, priest early on in his ministry. I say his ministry because his ministry was strange. He was a priest, but he wasn't a Christian. He even traveled to the United States to evangelize, but he wasn't a Christian. And he was on a ship in his travels, and there was a big storm, and he noticed the Moravians, who were true Christians, they had such peace in the midst of a storm, and he didn't have the peace. He was worried about going down. They were praising the Lord. He says, they have something I don't have. 
Well, when he got back to England, he was confronted, and he had been preaching for some time, and somebody said to him, Mr. Wesley, are you sure of your salvation? He said, well, Jesus Christ died for the whole world. The guy said, yes, we all believe that, but are you sure that you are saved? Wesley replied that he was sure that provision had been made for his salvation. The man said, yeah, but are you sure, Mr. Wesley, that you are saved, that it's personal to you, that, that God the Father is God your Father? Are you sure about that? And Wesley couldn't answer the question, and he wrestled with that. And finally, in his own words, it was at the age of 34, May 24th, 1738, that he settled the matter, that he received Christ. See, he had been trying to be a good person. He was in, in Adam trying to be a good person. But the, the leader of Team Adam is the flesh. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And so he saw his need. He put his faith and trust in Jesus. He was delivered that night. He was saved, and his life was transformed. Listen, you're in one of three places today. There, there are those who are secure, but they're not sure. That means you're saved, but you don't have assurance of salvation. And you're living life and you're very nervous because you don't know for sure if you're going to heaven. You've put your faith in Jesus, but you don't have the assurance of salvation. Second category is they're sure, but they're not secure. What does that mean? Oh, yeah, I've trusted Christ. Oh, yeah, I've been a, I prayed a prayer. I got baptized. I walked out when I was eight. I checked the box. I did whatever. But there's sin just all over your life, and there's no, there's no conviction of the Holy Spirit. There's no desire to follow the Holy Spirit. And they're holding on to something, and they say, I'm sure, but they don't have the reality. That's a dangerous place to be when you think you're saved and you're not Far better to be saved and think you're not than to think you're saved and not. But the Lord doesn't want us to be in either one of those places. He wants us to be sure and secure, to be saved and know we're saved. So we're not a doubting Christian hung over like a question mark, but we're like an exclamation point, a shouting Christian. Jesus died for me. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and I'm no longer on team Adam with the flesh leading. I'm on team in Christ with the Holy Spirit leading, and I'm not all I'm supposed to be yet, but I am following the Lord, and He has saved me, and all glory goes to Him. As we close out today, I want to ask you, do you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Listen, if you're not sure about that, just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you're a God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is making a difference in your life through this broadcast, to know that you just prayed that prayer. Please contact us. Let us know what's going on. We want to pray for you. We want to help you. You are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you.